chat, share them with us with the Q&A uh, button, also at the bottom of the page. Um, so I think we will be starting. I'm sure some more people um, will be joining. Um, welcome to all of our participants, all of our speakers, all of our interpreters. My name is Véronique Rioufol, and I am from the French organization Terre de Liens and the European Network Access to Land. It is a, a real pleasure for me today to be facilitating this webinar and, and welcoming you all um, on board. Um, as we've just seen, there will be interpretation for this webinar, so you can be choosing the language and you can be changing the language any point in time. We will have um, Spanish, French and English spoken today. I want to give a huge thank and we, we can't be clapping the way we would normally during a face-to-face a, a -face conference, but please, um, huge, uh, you know, think together with me, those huge thanks for our mm -hmm. uh, volunteers. Muchísimas gracias a los oradores que interpretan de manera voluntaria. No podemos aplaudirlos como solemos hacerlo en persona, pero um, hoy tenemos a Joel, Melina, Benla, Jonathan, Agnès y Cristóbal que nos están ayudando de, con la interpretación así a eux por el rol très importante en este webinar. Nous souhaitons également la bienvenue à quatre orateurs dans ce webinar. Be Federico Pacheco from ECVC, the European Coordination via Campesina and SOCSAT. Bienvenido, Federico. Um, just so that we can see you properly. Hola, Federico. Um, le, the second speaker, Antoine from Terre en Vue, uh, will be speaking in French. And our third, bonjour, Antoine. Bonjour. Our third and fourth speakers, uh, we have Raluca Dan. Hello, Raluca. Hi. And thanks for being with us today. And we have Attila Sox. Both of them are from the peasant organization Eco Ruralis. Um, we will be having a format today where we will start with a short introduction um, as you have seen in the in the invitation for joining the webinar the aim of this webinar is very much to present you a new publication that was collectively developed and published by a range of organizations and the aim of this webinar is to introduce you to this publication um, which is entitled your land my land our land um, and we will be exploring the different approaches and stories around land mobilizations, land struggles in Europe um, to preserve farmland and facilitate access to land for peasant farming and agroecology. Um, we will start with a short introduction and then the four speakers um, will be presenting um, different angles, different approaches of the, of the webinar. Um, this publication is freely available online we, I think, Jocelyn, some technical comments. We, we, we have a, um, a window on your screen that's hiding part of what you're showing us. I don't know if you can change that. Um, I'll, I'll still go on with the, with the introduction. So the, that publication, which was very recently published just two weeks ago, is freely available online. Um, you can find it on different websites. You can find it on the website of the European Coordination via Campesina, on the website of the Access to Land Network, on the website of Urgency. Um, it's available in all three languages that will be spoken today. Um, and um, it has been published by a, a range of organizations, prepared and published by a range of organizations, um, which have joined forces together over the past two years um, to, to, to develop uh, strategies around land use, land preservation, and access to land for peasant agroecology throughout Europe. Um, those organizations include, um, well, the, the ones of the speakers that you have today, European Coordination via Campesina, Urgency, which is the international network of CSAs, um, uh, well, worldwide, I guess, um, IFOM EU, the network of organic um, producers and consumers, we have the Transnational Institute, we have Eco Ruralis, we have my organization Terre de Lien, um, and we have the Wheel Farming Trust. Um, so those are the sort of um, very um, uh, practical, um, the, the organizations that have 
practically um, been facilitating that work, but that publication um, is part of a broader movement. It has been published as part of the Nieleni Europe and Central Asia platform for food sovereignty, which is the, the, the broadest, widest uh, movement for food sovereignty in Europe, bringing together um, hundreds of organizations of um, food, small scale food producers, consumers, rural development organizations, human rights activists, and so on, to advance food sovereignty in Europe. So this publication is very much part of that movement. Um, so we're very happy to be presenting it to you today. Um, one very practical point is that we are recording the webinar um, and the webinar will be made available um, in a couple of days on different websites. Um, same website as those where you can find the, the handbook. So I will, won't repeat them once more, but you, you can find also now in the, um, in the chat, you can find the links um, to the to the different language versions of the handbook if you want to also look at them as we're talking um, but uh, you can find them any point in time uh, on the on our websites um, also to mention that this uh, webinar is the first of a series of webinar around land strategies in Europe there will be two more before summer um, we'll come back to that at the at the very end but please stay tuned on our website or on our newsletter if you are interested to to follow up on those other webinars. Um, I can, yeah, it's good. Um, I, I can see we're struggling a bit with the presentation, but we, we, we will move on anyhow. Um, just a couple of more practical points uh, for everybody to enjoy the webinar. Um, so, as I said, there will be a short introduction of the handbook, then we will have the speakers, and then obviously we want, um, although we are quite uh, many of us, which is fantastic today, we do want to have some time for questions and answers. So I invite all of you to be sending your questions to the speakers through the question and answers button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and um, we will be taking those questions and asking the speakers to address those questions uh, in the second part of our webinar. I would like also to introduce you to my co-facilitator, my co today. We have um, first Alicia Sesum from the European Coordination Via Campesina. Hi Alicia and thanks a lot for your fantastic help. Alicia will be helping us with interpretation and any technical operation. So if you do encounter problems with interpretation or technical problems, do let us know and we'll try, try to address them as we go. Um, I would also like to introduce you to uh, Jocelyn Parot, um, who is the International Coordinator of Urgency and who will be um, uh, co-facilitating for the question and answers. So we'll come back to you later, Jocelyn. Thanks a lot as well for, for being there. Um, I will now um, start um, um, with the with the introduction of the of the webinar of the sorry of the handbook. Um, as I said, uh, we're very happy to be presenting this publication. Um, it's um, it's one of the first um, such publication. Um, it's part of a broader series of publication around land struggles, land mobilizations, um, and analysis of land issues in Europe. Um, you may have seen other publications in the past coming from the Hands on the Land Network uh, or the Hands of the Land platform together with other publications from the Access to Land Network. But I think it's the first time that we've been able to bring together in one publication a wide range of um, land struggles and land mobilizations to really highlight how those land mobilizations have been taking more and more importance, have been developing over the past decade in Europe, um, really showing the rising importance of land issues for the European continent, for food sovereignty in Europe, and the fact that more and more people, consumer groups, communities, obviously peasant farmers, different sorts of small-scale producers, um, are really taking land issues into their hands and really asking both for land policies and regulations to be um, improved, but also directly acting on the ground through a wide uh, range, a wide diversity of, um, of approaches. Um, so 
in in the book um, if you've looked through it and we'll come to those different approaches thanks to our uh, speakers you will see that we have identified six main um, approaches six main topic the first one uh, being very much about in a way, putting land on the agenda, how can you as an organization, as a movement, as a group of land activists, or as a maybe institution even, how can you really uh, push for land to be addressed in a very political way and claim land as a political matter to be taken into people's hands and policymakers' hands. So that's the first of our approach. And there's a number, for each approach, you will find a number of stories, practical experiences, cases illustrating um, the approach. Um, so for, for each of them, you have, um, I think from about um, 12 or 13 countries, in Europe, you have different stories and experiences being shared. Um, the second of our approach is on land laws and land policies, uh, really um, exploring how we can use the legal framework um, and, and make it work in a way to, to our benefit. How can we make land policies and land laws in Europe work to preserve farmland and, and work to advance uh, land for agroecology? Um, the third of our approach is about really land struggles from the from the ground up from the grassroots uh, what have been and what are currently land struggles in Europe that have been pushing for the preservation of farmland and, and the lutte pour la terre en Europe la tierra y la agricultura campesina el cuarto capítulo tiene que ver con otra temática sumamente importante eh, que tiene que ver con las tierras de dominio público de hecho en la mayoría de los eh, países Europa, europeos, gran parte del terreno está en dominio público, entonces eh, aquí reflexionamos sobre cómo eh, en calidad de organización o de movimiento o de actores podemos influir en los eh, actores políticos para eh, poder utilizar estas tierras y y que redunden en beneficio de, de todos. El capítulo 5 analiza cómo en esta última década hemos visto cómo las distintas comunidades de consumidores o grupos ciudadanos han cobrado importancia en torno a la... Y hay una recomposición muy interesante en torno a esta cuestión de comunidad, de construire des solidarités. Transfer of land that has been for centuries the, the main reality of, of, of farm transfer and, and, and land transfer. So uh, a whole chapter around that dimension of community. And finally, the last of our approach and chapter is around increasing the resiliency of our movements, of our land movements, land struggles. Um, and we have um, identified different example showing how by using um, um, uh, popular education, by using um, Um, different um, sort of legal tools, um, um, new funding streams, new funding opportunities, you can make your own movements more resilient and stronger and better connected as well through intersolidarity, through solidarity between different movements. So um, this is very much the structure and the content that you will find for the handbook. Um, as you may have seen, if you've gone through it, it's quite a long handbook because it's a 180 page um, almost. Um, It also includes some very practical, so as I said, it's a lot of very short, um, maybe two, three page uh, stories each time uh, recounting the experience of a specific struggle, specific organization around land. Um, also with some tips for practice on the different approaches identified. Um, so so it's, it's really meant to be a practical tool. It's meant to be not necessarily read from A to Z, but you can glance through it and, and and go for the bits that are useful to you at different points in time as you're adv advancing through your own uh, work and, and mobilizations. Um, I'll stop here with the general introduction of the handbook. Um, and I would like now to hand over to our speakers. Um, 
who will help us explore those different uh, chapters and approaches that I just mentioned. Um, the first of our speakers will be Federico Pacheco from ECVC and uh, the Andalusian um, um, Union, uh, Farmers Union and Land Workers Union, SOCSAT. Welcome Federico, bienvenido Federico. Um, and I would like you... Hola, ¿qué tal? Hola, muy bien. Como va? Muchas gracias, Veronique, por la introducción y por todo el trabajo que, que hay detrás de esta presentación del manual. Decir que desde la, la Vía Campesina Internacional, justamente eh, nosotros nos organizamos en la década de los 90, en el año 93, justamente en, por dos motivos principales. Uno fue eh, combatir el hecho de que la Organización Mundial de Comercio haya incluido a la producción agrícola dentro de los, de los productos sometidos al libre comercio, o sea, lo haya considerado mercancía. Y el otro gran eje de nuestro nacimiento fue el, el propósito de volver a plantear en las agendas de los estados y en la, y en la realidad económica y social la reforma agraria. ¿no? Desde, desde ahí tenemos un largo proceso en que para nosotros ha sido un eje central el pedir la reforma agraria integral, la reforma agraria popular. Hemos tenido muchísimas luchas, eh, incidencias y propuestas en torno a la tierra hasta lograr que en el artículo 17 de la Declaración de Derechos Campesinos esté contemplada como un derecho. Por eso para nosotros ha sido un eje eh, fundamental de considerar a la tierra no como una mercancía, sino como un recurso común y como un derecho del campesinado y de, la, y de las sociedades, ¿no? de los pueblos. Eh, explicar que para nosotros como SBC a nivel de Europa, este tema del manual hemos puesto mucha, mucha energía y le hemos dado mucha importancia porque para nosotros, eh, y tal como se explica en el manual, desde el año 2012 cuando retomamos junto a aliados y organizaciones, de distintas organizaciones europeas, de campesinos, de trabajadores, de consumidores, de investigadores, retomamos el tema de la tierra con la idea de eh, volver a plantear ese tema en la agenda europea, de, porque hasta este momento parece que el tema de la tierra y la reforma agraria era un asunto del sur, de los países menos desarrollados, y de que aquí todo estaba muy bien regulado por, por el mercado y bien distribuido. Y esa idea de hacer esa incidencia eh, a través de estudios académicos, incidencia política, incidencia social, buscar alianzas. Desde el principio, desde aquella reunión de 2012, dejamos claro que ninguna estrategia de incidencia y de cambio legislativo y social podía tener sentido o podía eh, fructificar si no había detrás una organización de la de los activistas, de los campesinos, de los trabajadores, y una estrategia de lucha de lucha por la tierra, ¿no?, a distintos niveles. Y ya hablábamos en ese momento de la necesidad de coordinar las distintas luchas a nivel europeo, de que uno, unas experiencias conocieran la, las realidades de otras experiencias, tanto históricas como actuales, y que pudiéramos entre todos actuar de una manera global y coordinada. Eh, act avanzamos mucho en estos años en lo que es la incidencia política, con, los, con el informe del Parlamento, las distintas publicaciones que se han hecho, y ahora en el proceso de, de propuesta de directiva europea en que estamos, pero eh, nos faltaba ese, ese anclaje sobre lo que es las luchas, eh, las luchas de base por la tierra. Y yo creo que este año pasado, eh, a través de estos proyectos, hemos podido, por un lado, hacer este seminario en París, donde fue un encuentro de distintas experiencias de, de lucha, donde pudimos compartir, intercambiar y aprender unos de otras, y por otro lado, esta idea de este manual en que pudiera eh, compendiar un poco todas estas, o una parte de estas experiencias, y poder eh, ser un inicio de, de, de intercambio, y también yo creo fundamentalmente de motivación. El manual está hecho con el objetivo de que aquellas personas, grupos, pueblos, organizaciones que se encuentren frente a un problema de la tierra, que vean que se está acaparando, que vean que son despojados o que no tienen acceso a la tierra, sepan que a través de la, de la lucha, a través de la organización, a través del apoyo mutuo, es posible lograr victorias. Ese es un objetivo fundamental. Y el otro es presentar 
un útil, un instrumento que es práctico porque nos da referencia, porque nos da ideas, porque nos da metodologías, pero también político, porque nos brinda una serie de argumentos eh, basados en, en normativas internacionales, nacionales y también políticas e históricas que son fundamentales al momento de poder poner en marcha una, una lucha, en este caso una lucha por la tierra, y poder tener el mayor apoyo social posible. Entonces, eh, yo creo que este manual es una, una propuesta para que sea utilizado, para que sea, sea difundido y para que tengamos, sea retroalimentado a través de más contenidos y de que sea la base de crear esa red de resistencia internacionalista global eh, que nos permita avanzar mucho más. Porque el tema de la tierra... El, los intereses que hay detrás del acaparamiento, de la concentración, del manejo de la tierra, son tan enormes, tanto históricamente como en la actualidad, que si no estamos eh, unidos en red y con todos los, los, los medios y mecanismos posibles a nuestro alcance al, al máximo nivel, pues es muy difícil avanzar. Este libro es, nos presenta eso, una, una motivación, una un conocimiento de lo que se ha hecho, pero sobre todo yo creo es un desafío, porque nos tiene que servir para seguir luchando por la tierra, conseguir más victorias y poder consolidar esta red que defienda la soberanía alimentaria, la agroecología, los derechos campesinos y que defienda también, en definitiva, eh, nuestra madre tierra, el planeta, eh, por lo que significa la, la defensa de la tierra, de los suelos y de los bosques. ¿no? Gracias. Thank you, Federico. Um, maybe would you like to um, comment us as well to, to make a connection with um, the, the third approach that we've been exploring, um, which is the, um, the, the land struggles, the, really from the ground up, the grassroots struggles. Would you like also to say maybe a word about um, the, the, the decades-long struggles that your union in Andalusia... ...sobre la lucha que lleváis ya haciendo desde hace décadas en Andalucía con distintas ocupaciones, la de Somonte en concreto. ¿Dices eh, hablar ahora, Veronique? Uh -huh. Por favor. Ah, vale, vale, vale. Sí, pensa, eh, sí a ver, yo creo que la... Eh, como decía antes, hay varios, eh, si, si vemos lo que es el, estos tres, como tú planteabas, los tres, los tres primeros capítulos del, del, del manual, hay una primera parte que es la, la, la lucha eh, política por poner en la mesa, en las agendas, el tema de la tierra. Que, que lo decía, que a nivel internacional, desde la vía campesina hemos hecho un gran trabajo, y a nivel de Europa, desde el año 2012, pues hay también una un gran éxito de que en las instituciones europeas, en la academia y en, y en la sociedad se reconozca que hay un, un problema de la, de la tierra. ¿no? Eh, la segunda parte, cuando habla de las propuestas eh, de normativas, eh, ahí estamos hablando de la utilización de las que ya existen, como las directrices voluntarias de la, de la gobernanza de la tierra y de los bosques, de la FAO, de la CSA, que fue también un logro de la sociedad civil, es un instrumento que hay que utilizar, pero eh, necesitamos avanzar en lo que es un, establecer un marco normativo europeo que eh, progresista en el sentido del, del derecho a la tierra. ¿no? Y en ese sentido estamos trabajando, y Europa es muy importante porque partimos de una realidad en que eh, la, el agricultor y la agricultora europea está culturalmente y de mucho tiempo muy afianzado en lo que es el concepto de la propiedad privada de la tierra, del minifundio del, de la tierra como, como, como un bien que se vende y se compra sin una, sin una regulación normativa administrativa o, o, en virtud, o, en, o para regular el interés social y la conservación de la tierra. Y yo creo que en eso hay que avanzar mucho y tenemos muchas propuestas para esta directiva de la tierra en ese sentido, para defender el suelo, la, los recursos naturales, el acceso a la tierra y combatir el, el acaparamiento. Y como tú decías antes y tal, las experiencias de lucha, que son las que nos van a fortalecer, nos van a organizar para lograr romper ese equilibrio contra ese poder tan 
tan enorme, que ya además no son solo eh, capitales o, o, o poderes económicos nacionales, sino que estamos hablando de grandes transnacionales con un poder ilimitado, mayor que muchos países, que eh, enfocan en la tierra uno de sus, de sus elementos de, de negocio. ¿no? Y para ello, las experiencias del SOC en, el, en Andalucía, nosotros somos una zona que tradicionalmente, desde la conquista castellana de Andalucía, pues la, la tierra ha estado, eh, ha estado partida en, en, en grandes latifundios, se ha quitado, se ha desposeído a la población de la tierra, y esto no ha cambiado hasta el día de hoy. El cambio es que los nobles y los grandes latifundistas han sido reemplazados por sociedades o por fondos de pensiones o por transnacionales. Eh, en nuestro caso, en Andalucía hay una tradición de lucha por la tierra de mucho tiempo, se logró en algunas épocas políticas, como en la, en la Segunda República, que se aplicara una reforma agraria real, pero esta fue una de las causas de que hubiera esa reacción fascista, el golpe de Estado y la guerra civil, que una de las primeras medidas que tomó fue anular la reforma agraria y desposeer de tierra a, lo, a los campesinos. Nosotros en estos años hemos, y para, para decir algunos ejemplos de que están también en el manual, hemos llevado una, un, campañas para pedir la, de ocupación, de acción directa, porque vemos que no hay otra manera, o sea, el bloqueo de las leyes y de los sistemas y de la prensa, apoyados por la prensa, son tan grandes que la única manera es realmente eh, tomar la tierra, en lo que en Vía Campesina llamamos la reforma agraria popular, no pedirla al Estado solamente, que también, sino ejercerla como un derecho. Los derechos se ganan a veces ejerciéndolos. Y en este caso hemos tenido ocupaciones de tierras públicas, como la, el caso de Somonte ha sido importante, porque nos ha permitido parar, eh, eh, a medias, pero por lo menos, o disminuir, un proceso de privatización de la tierra pública andaluza. También el caso de de este Cerro Libertad, en donde hemos tenido ocupada una finca del BBVA, de una gran multinacional bancaria, en donde está claro el uso especulativo que se le estaba dando a la tierra. Y el otro ejemplo que ponemos en el manual es la ocupación de un invernadero de Almería por migrantes marroquíes ante la quiebra de esa empresa y que permitió por lo menos una utilización por un tiempo. El, como digo, el poder al que nos enfrentamos es tan grande que ni la experiencia de Cerro Libertad ni la de, ni la de Simón Sabio del Invernadero pudieron continuar, la de Somonte sigue adelante y también eh, nuestro, nuestro apoyo, nuestra motivación son aquellas eh, luchas de los años 80, 90, como el caso de Marinaleda y de otras cooperativas, que realmente se pudo conseguir la tierra, se pudo conseguir un reconocimiento del Estado y que ahora están funcionando como cooperativas de de jornaleros y jornaleras. Thank you very much, Federico, for both um, sketching such a, a wide, long-term perspective on the importance of land mobilizations and political work around land issues on the European scene as well, con as connected with international um, developments, as well as presenting um, the, the uh, very important uh, struggles and mobilizations taking place in Andalusia up to this point in time. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to that as well um, during the debate um, with the participants. I would now like to turn to Antoine Gérard from Terre en Vue. Um, Antoine is a, a staff member of the Belgium organization Terre en Vue, who's, um, uh, which is uh, working for advancing um, um, access to land for um, um, agroecological farmers, uh, organic farm farmers and peasant farmers in Belgium. Um, um, Sorry, trying to highlight. Yeah, there you are, Antoine. Um, so, bienvenue uh, avec nous. Thanks again very much for joining us. Um, can you, in connection again with uh, some of what's been presented in the handbook, can you please um, share with us your experience of collaborating with local authorities in Belgium, um, as well as um, your own experience of what has been the new role of communities and citizens and consumers for facilitating access to land for farmers? Voilà, bonjour à tous, bonjour à toutes. Merci, uh, Véronique. De, de... Hi, everyone. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak in front of so many people. It's, it's very pleasant to be part of this. 
especially during the COVID times. Euh, je vais vous parler du, du chapitre 4. Bien, les voy a hablar sobre el capítulo 4 y 5 del manual. Le rôle que, que peuvent jouer les, les collectivités locales euh, pour faciliter l'accès à la terre pour l'agroécologie. Et le chapitre 5, lui, euh, porte plutôt sur le, le rôle des, des citoyens et des consommateurs euh, dans les luttes foncières. Euh, je vais essayer d'illustrer ces, ces deux chapitres euh, au moyen d'exemples de, voilà, de, de, que, que je connais moi de, de près, à savoir via le, le travail de, de Terre en vue. Euh, donc pour illustrer le, le chapitre 4 euh, sur le rôle des, des collectivités locales, je vais vous parler tout simplement euh, du cas de, de Bruxelles. Euh, alors d'abord, pour un petit peu vous, vous donner le, le contexte, euh, à Bruxelles, il y a déjà euh, une prise de conscience importante du monde politique euh, de l'importance de relocaliser la production alimentaire et de protéger euh, les terres agricoles. Donc les, les, voilà, les, les politiques ont exprimé très explicitement des objectifs euh, pour cela. On a par exemple à Bruxelles un objectif très clair d'atteindre 30% de la consommation en, en fruits et légumes produits euh, localement en 2030. Donc, c'est un objectif très fort euh, qui va permettre euh, voilà, de donner des idées, on va dire, à, à tout le monde, à, à la société civile, aux agriculteurs, etc. Et un autre chiffre que le gouvernement a, a mis en avant est le suivant. 100% des terres agricoles dans la région de Bruxelles doivent rester agricoles. Ce sont donc des, des engagements de nouveau très forts qui permettent de, de lutter contre la, la spéculation et de donner vraiment, on va dire, de jeter les bases pour la, la construction d'une politique agricole et alimentaire locale. Et donc, dans ce contexte, euh, la région bruxelloise a lancé un, un projet d'envergure euh, financé par un fonds européen, FEDER, euh, visant à soutenir la formation, l'installation de, de maraîchers mais également de les soutenir dans la transformation et dans la commercialisation de, leur, de leurs produits et également de, 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 de mener des recherches de terre pour installer de nouveaux agriculteurs. Et donc, on a un, un pouvoir public, la région bruxelloise, qui a pris en main la, la coordination de ce projet, tandis que, euh, est, enfin, en s'entourant, disons, d'acteurs de terrain. Et donc, But they are surrounded by local stakeholders. It will be the local stakeholders who undertake the work, but they will be coordinated by local authorities. There will be exchange discussions between these different actors. And that is where it becomes even more interesting. So there were very high expectations because... Enorme. Mais on a observé que finalement... Hemos podido constatar que esta historia de éxito que esperábamos al final no tuvo el éxito que esperábamos. No fue tal así. Este proyecto ha durado cinco años, pero al final no se han instalado decenas de horticultores nuevos en la región de Bruselas. Sin embargo, sí que ha habido cierto éxito en este proyecto y ha sido el siguiente. Las autoridades públicas, a través de alianzas fuertes con los actores sobre el terreno, se han hecho cargo de la problemática de las tierras. Puedo citar algunos ejemplos sobre los precios de las tierras, por ejemplo. Por supuesto, las autoridades públicas estaban al tanto de los problemas relacionados con el precio de las tierras, que no estaban regulados y que había precios totalmente desorbitados. Y absurdos, por supuesto, en relación con el valor real de las tierras. Pero claro, cuando se pusieron manos a la obra las autoridades públicas porque querían comprar este tipo de tierras, se dieron cuenta. Y estamos asistiendo al nacimiento de leyes que vayan a regular el precio de la tierra. De hecho, ya se ha creado un observatorio sobre el precio de la tierra que va a ser la primera herramienta para crear algo más sólido en los próximos años. El siguiente ejemplo tiene que ver con los contratos de arrendamiento. En Bélgica estos contratos son muy rígidos y establecen muchos límites. Transición uh, ecológica. 
parce que, tout simplement, il n'est pas possible de, de, de passer d'une agriculture conventionnelle portée vers l'export à une agriculture locale, nourricière, de par le fait que nous n'avons pas de levier pour faire évoluer les pratiques agricoles des agriculteurs en place, parce qu'ils ont des contrats qui les sécurisent très fort. Et donc, à nouveau, quand les pouvoirs publics se sont eux-mêmes rendus compte de la contrainte que formait euh, ce type de contrat et de, du fait qu'il n'existait pas de, de moyens légaux pour euh, faire changer les, les, les pratiques, euh, eh bien, on commençait à, à émerger de nouveau des, des idées, des expérimentations euh, pour faire évoluer la, la législation euh, et les pratiques. Et donc, euh, il y a eu une conscience au cours de ces années que pour mettre en place une politique agricole et une politique alimentaire de type « nous allons nous nourrir localement », eh bien, il fallait avoir une maîtrise sur le foncier. Donc voilà, d'où l'article ici qui a été rédigé dans ce handbook qui dit que, comme titre, avoir une politique foncière, donc être en mesure de faire un monitoring des terres dont on dispose et de savoir quand, quelle terre va pouvoir être libérée, de mettre en place des outils de régulation et de, de, de libération de terres pour... Eh bien, cela est vraiment un prérequis pour mener des, des politiques euh, agricoles et des politiques euh, alimentaires. Voilà. Ah, J'ai un, un, un collègue qui me donne des, des fraises pour me donner de l'énergie pour la suite du discours. <rire> Euh, voilà, j'avance, je, je, je vois le temps qui passe évidemment. Donc la plus grande réussite de notre action à Bruxelles n'a pas été de multiplier par 5 le nombre d'agriculteurs installés, mais bien de multiplier par 5 le nombre de fonctionnaires qui travaillent sur cette thématique. Et ce n'est pas la quantité qui compte, c'est la qualité, hein, la preuve. Euh, ce ne sont pas simplement des fonctionnaires, euh, ce n'est pas le nombre de fonctionnaires qui compte, mais c'est la qualité. Donc, on, a, on voit vraiment qu'il y a une expertise qui se développe au sein de la région par rapport aux questions foncières, agricoles, etc. Et donc, c'est vraiment là que l'interaction finalement entre pouvoir public et organisation de terrain a permis de nourrir la réflexion publique et, 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 et laisse entrevoir un, un avenir meilleur. Voilà, je pense que je vais m'arrêter là pour le, le chapitre 4 sur le rôle des pouvoirs publics. On, on pourra en revenir dessus dans, dans les questions-réponses. Le chapitre 5, lui, porte vraiment sur le rôle des citoyens, des consommateurs. Euh, il y a énormément d'exemples très intéressants dans, dans le handbook euh, et vous en connaissez sûrement encore beaucoup d'autres. C'est une logique très, très actuelle. Euh, et pour illustrer euh, cette dynamique-là, je vais simplement présenter le, le travail de terre en vue euh, qui finalement repose très fortement sur euh, les citoyens. Et donc, la coopérative Terre en vue a été créée pour sauvegarder des fermes agroécologiques qui sont menacées par la vente d'une terre qu'elles occupent ou qui ont besoin de trouver de, de nouvelles terres sous menace de, de périclité. Et donc, la coopérative de Terre en vue a été créée sur un principe très simple. La coopérative achète les terres à l'aide de l'épargne de citoyens qui souhaitent soutenir le projet et la coopérative, une fois qu'elle dispose vraiment de la propriété de la terre, va les mettre à disposition à long terme aux agriculteurs qui l'occupaient par le passé. Voilà, c'est un exemple très puissant qui montre que la solidarité entre citoyens peut finalement venir réguler ou plutôt... Enfin, lutter contre le problème des prix des terres qui sont beaucoup trop élevés. Euh, voilà, je, je m'arrête là. Euh, Merci beaucoup Antoine. Thank you very much for helping us um, indeed understand better both the, the role we can have and the use we can make of public land um, together with um, the new role and the new importance that communities and consumers have been, have been endorsing with regard to access to land and land preservation in Europe. Um, 
just before I turn to our next speakers, I would just like to remind you that you can um, send questions for the for the speakers through the Q and A. Um, you have a small icon at the bottom of your screen that you can use. Um, please do send us uh, your questions. We'll we'll now move on for the next speakers. Have a couple of introductory questions, but then we'll we'll move to the Q and A. So feel free to to share with us your comments and questions. Um, so I would now like to turn to the next speakers, so Raluca Dan um, from Ecoralis and um, Attila Schox from Ecoralis as well. Um, welcome and, and thanks a lot uh, for joining us from um, the Romanian Peasant Organization, Peasant Union Ecoralis. Um, I would like to hear from you now, um, uh, Raluca, you've been part of one of the most symbolic and most successful as well um, land struggles in Europe, the, the huge uh, mass mobilization and international solidarity movement to stop the project of mining in Rosia Montana. Um, can, you, can you share with us a little bit the, the, both the experience and the lessons from that struggle? Hi, uh, Veronique, and hi to all of uh, those of you who joined us uh, today. Uh, indeed, I was part of the Save Rosia Montana campaign. That is one of the cases presented in our uh, in our brochure, as uh, when thinking about struggles uh, for land built from ground up. And as you said, the uh, Save Rosia Montana campaign wrote a page in in Romanian history, being the first emblematic civil society uh, movement from um, 1989 to uh, to present. A uh, struggle that started from a um, local rural uh, community and growing to a national and an international widespread successful campaign against uh, what was planned to be um, the biggest open cast gold mine uh, in, uh, in Europe. Um, what I think I should say first uh, for all those of you who joined us today and might, might not know um, or have heard about uh, Rosha Montana is that uh, Rosha Montana is a village, a commune in the Western mountainous uh, Transylvania, consisting in 16 villages and about uh, 4,000 uh, people that we witnessed through a time span of 2,000 years, underground uh, uh, gold uh, mining that left therefore a huge archeological, cultural and uh, natural heritage. So the Save Rosha Montana campaign has been uh, since uh, the year 2000, the campaign initiated by the villagers of Rosha Montana against this uh, proposed biggest open cast gold mine in Europe uh, proposed by the um, Romanian-Canadian joint venture uh, Rosia Montana Gold uh, Corporation. Um, before um, approaching um, the strategy that was adopted by, uh, by the campaign and what made it so, uh, so successful, I think it is important somehow to, um, to highlight, um, to be aware of the environment in which the campaign uh, developed. Uh, it was a very averse environment, um, uh, hostile uh, and very disproportionate in, in forces. We are thinking about uh, a project that has been heavily advocated by uh, ministers and prime ministers. We are talking about uh, local decisions that have been taken against the citizens, citizens to maintain poverty in the area and uh, for them not being capable of uh, having uh, an income at local level. Um, we are talking about a uh, blockade in the mainstream media pushed by the, the Rosia Montana Gold Corporation. For example, in a couple of years, uh, uh, the company infused 5.5 million euro in red card uh, advertising in favor of the project. Um, we are talking about threats and uh, intimidation conducted by, by the company and um, spurred division among the, the local community. So this is the environment where uh, the Save Rosia Montana campaign had to uh, choose what uh, instruments and ways work best 
for for it uh, to manage to um, push for the voice of the of the local uh, community therefore uh, since the beginning of the um, of the campaign uh, that was uh, initiated and coordinated by the villagers through their local association called alburnus major which means rosha montana in in latin um, the campaign um, operated on several directions la campagne finalement a pris plusieurs directions mais l'objectif était le même D'abord, il était important pour les villageois de gagner du soutien en dehors du village, de gagner le soutien de militants, d'organisations, de personnages publics, de militants, d'institutions ou encore d'universitaires. Pendant ces campagnes, des centaines d'organisations étaient impliquées dans le soutien des communautés locales. Il y avait des organisations environnementales, des organisations de recherche, des organisations culturelles, des acteurs, des chanteurs, des cantantes, représentantes de distintas organisations, tous se manifestaron a favor de esta comunidad y mostraron su apoyo a esta iniciativa. Por otro lado, eh, el objetivo de la comunidad era estar implicados en el proceso de evaluación, porque en general la administración local es decir, y el... So, within the Save Rocha Montana campaign, of course, with the, the help of um, several lawyers and uh, jurists, uh, pro bono ones, um, initiated litigation processes against um, assessments submitted by the company or against um, permissions issued by the national government. The villagers participated in several uh, public, local public uh, consultations and um, all this went up even to, uh, to international um, actions in trying to um, obtain a ban on, on cyanide at, uh, at European level. So the litigation aspect, it was one of the core uh, key strategies of the, of the campaign. A third direction, I would say, it was to, to break the silence, to break the blockade that was imposed by the uh, mainstream uh, media. As I've said, the Rocha Montana Gold Corporation paid a lot of money to promote uh, uh, the project and to block the arguments that uh, stand against the binding project. So inside the campaign, several organizations and individuals in a coordinated community ran uh, mass uh, protests, uh, marches, um, mass postering actions all over uh, the country, installed information points for people to know about the voices of uh, people in, in Russia, Montana. Um, organized even a local festival in Rocha Montana called the Hayfest for others to come and know the, the people, the beauty of the place and what is going to be lost if the project is going to, to happen. Um, what managed for the campaign to um, grow in an uh, international one Was networking with Ahora bien, lo que hizo que el movimiento se volviera internacional fue la interrelación con otros grupos que estaban en contra de esta eh, minería y este proyecto de mega explotación. Entonces organizamos eh, acciones comunitarias, llevamos adelante campañas internacionales para prohibir el uso eh, de estas prácticas mineras. Entonces, en un momento de dado a lo largo de la campaña resultó de su importancia que 
todos supieran qué significaba el desarrollo sostenible en esta comunidad. Entonces, la población local y otros eh, adeptos comenzaron a lanzar las propuestas. Un ejemplo de ello fue una iniciativa para que Roja Montana fuera reconocido como Patrimonio de la Humanidad por parte de la UNESCO. Y considero entonces que todas estas acciones sumadas a la situación que describí antes, más algunos escasos recursos financieros, con el correr de los años posibilitaron esta campaña de Roya, Roya Montana y permitieron que esta campaña y esta lucha fuera oída y trascendiera eh, los límites de la comunidad en sí. y que esto se convirtiera en una lucha nacional por la democracia, y que millones y miles de personas se reunieran en 2013 en una protesta masiva en distintas ciudades de Rumanía, pero no solo dentro de Rumanía, sino también en otros lugares. Y gracias a ello hemos podido frenar este proyecto, pero por supuesto que de cara al futuro es importante entender que hay muchos gobiernos que siguen tratando de que este proyecto se cristalice. Así que estos han sido, este ha sido una breve síntesis del de proyecto, de esta campaña. Así que si hay alguna pregunta, estaré encantada de responderla. Muchas gracias, Raluca, por compartir esta historia y la lucha de Roger Montana. Creo que esta es una lucha que la mayoría de nosotros lo hemos escuchado porque ha sido una lucha tan larga y emblemática para Europa. Ahora voy a volver a ti, Attila, si puedes, tal vez, decirnos más también sobre los problemas de tierra y los problemas de tierra, en general, en Rumanía y en Europa Europa. Thank you, Veronique. Hi, um, and uh, greetings from another uh, mountainous uh, village from Romania, where I'm situated, close to Roșia Montana also. So my name is Attila Search, and I'm uh, the president of Eco Rallis and also uh, working on land rights in, in the frame of our organization. And my plan is to give a little bit of an Eastern European overview uh, especially also focusing on Romania, on, on, on the, 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 the issue of land. So basically, um, we are coming from a region that is, is literally full of farmers, of peasant farmers. We are more than, only in Romania, there are more than 3 million active peasant farmers. So when Romania joined the European Union, it also brought this unique legacy and single-handedly basically reshaped the agricultural scene of the European Union. So peasant farming, um, uh, basically in our region, historically shaped and continues to be the central identity of our culture and uh, relationship with, with the food and with the natural environment. And peasants in Romania are named Tzaran, which means people of the land, people connected with the land. So basically for peasants, uh, land is a territory, a natural resource, and the basis on which we exercise our right to produce food, to engage into dignified work, and to have a decent income. So uh, our perspective uh, from a political point of view is also a bit different. Uh, uh, historically, as many of you probably know, by dropping the Iron Curtain uh, over Europe, uh, Eastern Europe became uh, much more of a communist character politically. And this has brought the, a strong deconnection of peasantry with land. So uh, this meant forced collectivization, it meant brutal state control and uh, an imposing of an agro-industrial model that created large land concentration. And this happened for tens and tens of years. So it means that uh, uh, peasant farmers have been disrupted for farming and turned into other kind of jobs or pushed aside of society. Uh, and this hugely contributed to the agricultural landscape that we see today in Eastern Europe. So presently the situation uh, is uh, that it uh, transformed because after uh, 1989, when the system changes have successively happened in Eastern European countries, peasants were the first to claim back their right to land in form of historical property. 
So nonetheless, the establishment of the neoliberal governments in Eastern Europe have transformed our landscapes into a free market battleground for large land acquisitions and basically outright land grabbing. So um, as lands have become transformed into this merchandise, into this speculative commodity in Eastern Europe, it's, it's not a surprise everywhere in Europe, not just in Eastern Europe, but coming out from this uh, communist past, it also results that currently in Romania and Ukraine, for instance, are some of the most land grab countries from, from, from Eastern Europe and in Europe per whole. So only in Romania, for instance, a country that has 40 million hectares of agricultural land, several millions of hectares are already controlled by speculative hedge funds, banks, oligarchy, uh, and even insurance companies. So the availability of uh, land for peasant agriculture is shrinking, and especially young farmers have it very hard to access land and to continue farming. The situation is similar in, in other countries like Serbia or Bulgaria or Lithuania. Um, and so, it's a strong mobilization was needed in this new context. Uh, basically, um, uh, after so many years of, of brutal uh, collectivization, uh, we were shrugging, shrugging our shoulders about how can we do and what, do we, what can we do. And the first thing is to look into creating transparency. We did not know what's happening with land markets in Eastern Europe anymore because of all these changes and all these actors that revolve around us that are non-farming actors, many. So basically peasant movements like Eco Rallies were mobilizing, engaging with creating transparency on land grabbing uh, in, a, in a time when there was no official acceptance or information on this destructive phenomenon. So we teamed up with activist researchers, the journalists and civil society. And some of this work is indeed described in the handbook of how this, this happened. We quickly pointed out that land concentration, land grabbing are, are uh, heavily enabled by these newly created permissive land markets. So it, it's also a policy question, faulty policy uh, uh, that favors outright large-scale large, large land purchases and uh, does not safeguard peasantry and local communities against land grabbing. So um, we have highlighted that even that once Romania became part of the European Union, that, that the common agriculture policy, for instance, is a, is a large backer of land concentration through area-based subsidies and support for large-scale farming, industrialized farming. So while our bulk of work is indeed grassroots, we also feel obliged to be part of the debate on national and international uh, well, European policy analysis from, from the grassroots peasant perspective to bring our proposals and to amend current policies and to try to change the current situation over land markets. And in this, we found uh, a very good tool in the United Nations Standing Guidelines that are also mentioned in the handbook. Uh, we advocate for the safeguarding measures that, is, that are described in the guidelines, like preemptive rights, preserving land for multinational, uh, from multinational speculation, and for the establishment of ceilings on land acquisitions and in the overall democratization of land control. So while the land debate right now is a very hot topic in Eastern Europe, uh, it's very much present on the political agenda of the, of the European countries and also in our thoughts and in our actions. Uh, we advocate for inclusive and just land policies that enable food sovereignty to agroecology, but we observe that the Eastern European governments tend to use much more of a right-wing and populist card when debating on the future of land markets. Um, and well-known examples exist around us like Hungary or Poland, but also in my country, in Romania, uh, the, ten, the trends are following the same, same route. So basically these land policies uh, discriminate uh, access to land based on nationality or expertise in farming or establishment. And um, needless to say that the European Union is already responding with infringement procedures against Eastern European countries. So it's very uh, important and through the handbook we are promoting grassroots approaches and inclusive approaches and just approaches uh, on how to amend and how to transform our land policies in, in our national countries or might that be on EU level. But it's also about non-EU countries that, for instance, like in Ukraine, where we witness now a um, uh, large liberalization of the lands and the opening up of the land markets. And why is this happening? On pressure from World Bank, on pressure from International Monetary Fund. So we need that our claims and analysis of our fellow peasants and activists from Ukraine to be also presented and in the handbook. And that's what happened. And we have a, a wonderful case also on that. Um, so in closing, what I would like to highlight that our Eastern European land struggles are very much connected 
uh, as the handbook highlights, uh, uh, peasants, uh, women, men, and youth engaged into farming, both coming from European north to south or, or west to east, are actively resisting land grabbing and the commodification of land. And we are claiming land policies that are just and enable food sovereignty on fr from a local to an international level. And yeah, I, I think that it, it's not easy to give a five minute insight on Eastern Europe. So I'm, I'm confident that I spurred some, some questions and some, some debate in, in here. And I urge you to dig deeper in the handbook and to harvest this inspiration that, that can, can spur actions in, in, in also in several regions of Europe. So thank you, thank you, and uh, I, I can answer any questions with my eyes. Thank you very much, Attila. Thanks again, Raluca, and all the speakers. Um, it's been great to be able to move um, together with you through the different approaches and the different countries and the different um, experiences um, uh, presented in the handbook. Um, I still invite you uh, invite the participants to ask um, some questions through, through the Q&A if you'd like. Um, we are planning to finish the, um, the webinar at, um, well, I guess, 3.30 for CET, uh, Central European time, so in half an hour, more or less. Um, so we do have some time for questions and answers. Um, maybe to, to get started with the debate and, and to build upon your last point, Attila, um, I would like to ask all of our speakers, um, I mean, as we've seen through your presentations, um, the handbook does present um, a, a diversity of approaches, a diversity of struggles, mobilizations from different different countries, what would you say are the synergies or the similarities between those different um, land mobilizations? So um, the question is addressed to all of the speakers. I don't know who wants to, to start first. You can raise your hand. Um, I'm actually not, yeah. And uh, Federico, Tamien, if, if you can um, switch on your camera. That way we will see all of the speakers. Just allowing for interpretation. Wow. Maybe I can start. And um, please do start. Hand. Yeah, Federico is coming. Please do start. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just because my uh, microphone. Oh, not <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Uh, just to, to give uh, a brief answer from, from my side, I think what connects us is that we look at land uh, uh, differently than in, in a way that uh, the last 50 years, for instance, just to give an example, uh, have, have been looking at land. We cannot treat land anymore as a commodity. We cannot treat land anymore as a mere merchandise that we transact. Uh, land is much more, and it has already been long showed, and we are actively showing this every day by our work and our connection with land. So I think in the handbook, what really connects all these struggles and what connects all the different examples and approaches is the fact that land uh, is a natural resource and it's a territory that needs to be defended and needs to be promoted uh, uh, in a different way. And all of us are responsible into safeguarding land. Uh, so that, that I would say that uh, is the underlining factor of the handbook that although we do things differently because our national context is different and it, it, this Eastern Western uh, difference, for instance, as I was mentioning, uh, we connect in a very natural way because we, we feel as one when we come to land uh, and we work out our own uh, approaches through the context of, of what we are in and through the struggles that we are facing. So that's what I would respond. Thank you. Um, maybe Federico? Sí, yo creo que la, la importancia de, la, de este abanico de, de luchas que se, que se plantea y de realidades, por una parte es como decía Atila, que hay una, una visión común que tenemos de, de otro tipo de, de modelo agrícola, otro tipo de, de utilización de los recursos comunes, ¿no? Y donde la, la tierra tiene que ser un bien común o tiene que ser un bien de interés social y no una mercancía, creo que lo, lo ha dicho claramente. Y también eh, yo creo que el libro, como, como decimos, tiene que mm, aunar lo que son las luchas eh, urbanas, rurales, los distintos contextos, 
en una estrategia de que la sociedad en su conjunto vea que la, la lucha por la tierra, la lucha contra el acaparamiento, la lucha por una tierra en uso de, de agricultores campesinos, de que los jóvenes o los jornaleros sin tierra puedan acceder eh, a la tierra y vivir de ella. Por eso hablamos de una reforma rural integral, en donde no solo se tenga la tierra, sino el acceso a los mercados, a la, a la maquinaria, a las semillas, al agua. Entonces, que eso la sociedad entera entienda de que ahí nos estamos jugando eh, todos y todas nuestra, nuestro interés. No solo porque beneficia el, este modelo agrícola y de tenencia de la tierra, que incluye la, la tenencia de la tierra, eh, no, no solo combate el cambio climático, no solo re, eh, preserva el suelo, los bosques y los recursos naturales, sino que garantiza una mejor calidad de alimentación y, como hemos visto en esta crisis del coronavirus, también asegura una, una producción local que eh, beneficia la, la salud y que es mucho más resiliente y mucho más fuerte frente a estos problemas de globalización como, como ha sido el caso de la, de la pandemia. En eso para nosotros, cuando hablamos, por ejemplo, de, de reforma rural popular, hablamos de eso, de una alianza de clase en donde estén los campesinos, los trabajadores rurales y la gente de la ciudad, que, los trabajadores y trabajadoras de la ciudad que vean que de una manera so social, económica, alimentaria, tenemos un mismo interés. Y yo creo que el, el manual lo refleja, y en eso tiene que ser un elemento, como, como decía antes, de que, de que cada vez tengamos más integración y más respuesta a las propuestas que allí hacemos. Thank you very much. Um, maybe also um, your perspective on the question, Antoine? Oui, tout à fait. Je, je partage euh, tout à fait le, le point de vue de, de, de Federico et de Attila, euh, et pour terre en vue aussi euh, de, de, de la question de, de la terre comme un bien commun. Euh, We also euh, see land as a common. This is a, a thread that runs through all these struggles. In Belgium, also, we are observing all these mobilizations and struggles, they're all happening here in Belgium too. Des agriculteurs qui s'installent sur des terrains qui sont menacés d'être bâtis. Et ce qui est très intéressant, je trouve, c'est de constater que toutes ces mobilisations différentes se renforcent, bien évidemment. Et donc, quand on parle de synergie, je pense que quand on a une lutte directe avec, en parallèle, des pouvoirs publics qui s'intéressent à la question avec en parallèle des citoyens qui se mobilisent. Euh, on a tout simplement une influence politique qui, qui grandit euh, comme une bulle et qui fatalement doit, doit aboutir à, à un nouvel équilibre avec euh, une meilleure régulation euh, du marché euh, foncier. Euh, et, puis, et puis, comme le dit Frédéric, oh, la, la question du, du changement climatique, euh, de l'importance de retourner vers... Euh, vers des circuits courts et vers une, une agriculture nourricière. Tout ça est, est tout simplement de, de plus en plus logique. Euh, et donc, je pense qu'on on, on est en train d'évoluer avec toutes ces différentes euh, mobilisations euh, vers une, une, une amélioration de la situation et, et une lutte contre l'accaparement des terres qui est de plus en plus structurée euh, également. On a parlé des différents réseaux euh, et de l'importance de se mettre en réseau quand on, quand on entame ce genre de lutte. Et, et comme l'a dit Attila, je pense qu'une des grandes forces, si, si, si parmi ceux qui nous écoutent, certains euh, démarrent euh, des luttes similaires pour, euh, pour, pour l'agriculture dont, dont ils rêvent, eh bien, c'est très important de se mettre en réseau. Et je pense que c'est aussi une des, des, des choses que ce handbook euh, offre véritablement. Euh, voilà, c'est un carnet d'adresses pour, pour s'inspirer, pour se renforcer. Uh, et toutes ces mobilisations se, se renforcent, uh, selon moi. Oui. Merci beaucoup. Um, Raloka, would you like to, to add something? I would that, uh, add something more from the, um, let's say, practical uh, perspectives. Uh, the brochure presents several uh, cases and uh, with different uh, approaches or, let's say, uh, different... Um, cocktail recipes of the instruments that they have um, they have used but 
what I think it's uh, it's common for uh, for all of them is that they have uh, tried to build a coalition and to attract supporters for their uh, cause. They have tried to uh, understand better what is the legal context that they are um, moving in and what are their opportunities or uh, threats so they can act even uh, even better. Uh, they build a base of, uh, of arguments so that they can uh, attract uh, even uh, more uh, supporters and in, engage in, um, in actions to uh, make people aware of the, um, of the causes they are uh, promoting. Um, so it is the context, the national or the cultural context, it might be uh, different and this sometimes uh, dictates what kind of uh, instrument and uh, how much or how often they should be uh, used for the right uh, uh, strategy to, to succeed. But in the end, I think no matter how uh, small or huge the um, um, struggle is, uh, the instruments are more or less uh, the same. And I think this is uh, to be taken by everyone who reads the brochure also, that uh, it is, um, it can be easy somehow to understand from, uh, from all these cases to start, uh, to have a base start for um, initiating a local struggle. Thank you very much. I, I think indeed um, we, we started with the vision that um, we would want to bring together, bring closer the different struggles and mobilizations in Europe. And it was a bit of a, of a bet, really. Um, but um, I think the handbook does show um, the complementarities and the synergies to be strengthened between those different mobilizations across Europe. Um, so, so thanks a lot to, for you, to all speakers for your answers on this first question. I would now like to turn to Jocelyn Parot uh, from Urgency um, to reflect on some of the questions um, asked by the participants through the Q&A. Please, um, we already have received a number of questions. Um, please do continue sending in your questions. We'll try to take some um, as we go. Jocelyn? Yes, so that's uh, great because uh, the, the question, the Q&A was quite quiet for a while and suddenly it got very much animated. So we have already eight different questions and I think it would be difficult to uh, answer all of them, to address all of them, but maybe we can ask with uh, two first ones. One question is from Old Shibing Girl and it goes like this. What do you think is the role and responsibility of the local governments in relation to the land issues? and also to access to the local and territorial markets for the agroecological agroecological producers and the other question i pre-selected is uh, about um, other um, initiatives in other parts of the world it's a question about a nice uh, initiative in salvador canasta campesina and basically the question is uh, do we know of any experience in latin america this handbook is about Europe, but I think it's a good question to ask about solidarity with uh, other parts of the world. So that's it for the panel now, and I can go with more questions in the next round. Sí, yo, Veronique, eh, decir sobre la, las luchas a nivel internacional, eh, normalmente las la luchas por la tierra son eh, muchísimo más numerosas, profundas y duras en, en el resto del, del mundo que en Europa, digamos, en este momento. ¿no? En, en América Latina tiene una tradición de, de luchas por la tierra y de, y de construcción. De hecho, el día de la... De la, de la lucha campesina eh, representa la, la masacre de, del Dorado de, de Pará, allí en el norte de Brasil, 
eh, y, y bueno, y, y podemos hablar de, de Indonesia, podemos hablar de, de África, de muchos sitios en donde la, las luchas son enormes. El, un, hay un, con, la, con la iniciativa esta de las directrices voluntarias de la gobernanza de la tierra y de los bosques de la FAO, se hizo un trabajo con muchas organizaciones a nivel de todo el planeta, allí está plasmada la realidad un poco de, de, de muchos sitios, de muchos países, y hay un manual que también se hizo del manual de aplicación de estas directrices, que es muy interesante porque también refleja muchos, eh, muchos ejemplos de distintas partes del mundo, ¿no? Y sobre todo, bueno, para, no sé, dentro de las organizaciones de vía campesina, todos conocéis un poco el, lo que es el MCT, el Movimiento Sin Tierra de Brasil, o el SPI, los, 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 el Sindicato de Indonesia, como son como grandes organizaciones que han luchado por la reforma agraria y que permanentemente están con, con ese tema. Thank you, Federico. Does uh, anybody from the panel want to reply to one of the two first questions? Yes, yes. Uh, Attila here. Attila. Um, I think uh, this question of local authorities is very important and uh, you will see it highlighted in, in several cases, of course, in the handbook also, but I want to refer to a case where local authorities uh, were crucial and failed to live up to their, to their standards. And it, that's the case when uh, we have teamed up with journalists in order to create transparency over land grabbing. And we have um, highlighted the way uh, the money from, from an international bank flows into buying lands in, in, in Romania, uh, ten, uh, more than uh, 20,000 hectares of land. Uh, and the role of local, local uh, authorities in this, uh, in this deal was crucial. And not because, well, because they should have been the stewards of local society and uh, uh, not uh, being corrupt and not opening up the, the land books to, to, uh, without any permission. Uh, local authorities hold a lot of information and a lot of power on a local level. And uh, when, what we found out through the case uh, of investigating this large bank and uh, their buyouts in Romania is that they have been working with local authorities uh, and the local authorities were using their power in order to force people to sell off their lands. Uh, local authorities also play double role because mayors, from, mayors, for instance, have also been owning land and they have been uh, uh, drawing more to their own businesses than to the public. Uh, good. So that one way that local authorities uh, uh, failed, for instance, uh, here in Romania. Nonetheless, uh, right now in the policy debates, local authorities have also high roles because uh, um, preemption rights, for instance, that we have been fighting for uh, in the land market, uh, they give very much uh, power to local authorities. The local authorities have to manage the whole process of preemption rights, to put uh, any kind of land sale, uh, to be very transparent about it, to consult the preemptors and so on. So it's crucial in the, in the topic of land to have very uh, uh, transparent and uncorrupt local uh, governance. And that is the first step in the process. Now, just to finish up from my side, is that uh, uh, on, as Eastern European countries are much more centralized, let's say, than Western European countries. So while Western, in Western Europe, you find out that uh, regional authorities have higher power. In Romania, for instance, if uh, we want to deal with land issues, then we need to go to the centralized authority. So we are talking to the government, we are talking to the parliament, where everything is being debated. So that's about what I would like to say about this. Thank you, Attila. Uh, maybe another question, which is really related to the dissemination of the um, uh, of this handbook. One question from Gail Wedon from Terre de Lien Normandy, which is a, a regional uh, branch of uh, Terre de Lien. And the question is basically how this handbook is going to be disseminated within our networks. Uh, and really a question to maybe to Raluca and Antoine, uh, how do you see like the use of this handbook within your own networks in Belgium and, and Romania? Okay, can you hear me? Thank you. Go ahead, uh, yes, Raluca. Go ahead, Raluca. Okay, good. 
Well, um, as uh, Veronique highlighted at the beginning of the of the seminar, this uh, brochure is uh, published under the uh, Nieleni uh, movement for food sovereignty in Europe and and Central Asia, and uh, that means that we already have a very um, great uh, base of um, organizations, activists, individuals uh, from several constituencies, starting from uh, small scale producers, researchers, environmental uh, NGOs, journalists, where uh, from the beginning this brochure is going to be uh, going to be disseminated. And um, here in uh, in Romania, in our case, of course, we are going to uh, spread it among the organizations we are working with, and um, most um, especially through the. Um, uh, rural communities that we are uh, working with and uh, peasant men and, and women because um, we think and we hope actually that this uh, brochure draws a lot of uh, inspiration and uh, uh, rather than feeling uh, intimidated of certain uh, cases that uh, have been successful so far um, try and uh, see what are the, the lessons that can be, be um, applied uh, starting at local level by um, any uh, local community, any activists, uh, informal group or formal group. Um, so I think with this we are going to, to start with, uh, with the Nieleni uh, movement. Bah, tout à fait, je, je dirais un petit peu comme euh, Raluca, le, notre euh, objectif va être, euh, à l'aide de, de ce manuel, de, de rentrer en contact avec encore plus euh, de, de personnes, d'activistes qui sont euh, actifs dans des luttes, euh, mais également d'autorités locales, tout à fait. Euh, C'est toujours évidemment euh, intéressant euh, d'arriver avec une, une telle quantité d'informations euh, dans un si beau document aussi, euh, et en troisième lieu, le monde académique également avec qui nous sommes forts en contact, qui sera évidemment très intéressé de voir tous ces exemples rassemblés. Thank you, thanks a lot, Antoine. Um, another question um, that that is linked to the to the to the news. Um, a question about the COVID-19 situation and um, whether it has helped um, in the way that land would be considered now differently by people or politicians, not as a commodity, but as an important resource uh, for the society. Uh, is this something that you, you have seen in your uh, local context? Can I ask all the speakers to take this question? And answer very shortly, very brief, briefly, please, as you're, we're nearing the end. Who wants to go first? Maybe I can. Uh, Atina, thank you. So, uh, well, very shortly about the, the current uh, pandemic and our situation around land is what we see in Eastern Europe is unfortunately that in these times of emergency measures, uh, what we tend to see is not a democratization, but uh, much more like an autocrat autocratic approach towards uh, law and justice and creation, creating uh, legislation. So transparency has unfortunately diminished in these times. Uh, that is my personal uh, reflection. And uh, it was very hard to, to look inside the land debate under these circumstances. And now that the, the relaxation happened a little bit, we observed that, for instance, the amendments to the Romanian land market law have been uh, uh, already done. So it, indeed, it was uh, much more of a problem uh, in these times. But on the other hand, uh, in these times of uh, COVID-19, a lot of uh, uh, consumers have turned towards localized production, have turned towards short food chains. Uh, there's a high demand, uh, both politically and practically. So here we have a, a, a big stake to play and we are doing our part. So in the times of the pandemic, it's also an opportunity to, to show the value of our food systems and what we promote. Thank you, Attila. 
somebody else on this last question? Sí, yo quería un poco, sí, quería decir que, a ver, si la pandemia nos ha mostrado algo es la, la importancia de, la, de, de nuestra propuesta de soberanía alimentaria, es decir, por una parte, como ante situaciones eh, en donde la, la globalización económica eh, tiene problemas, ¿no? en este caso a través de la, de la pandemia de un virus, pero puede ser por otros motivos, que ante esa eh, nos ha mostrado la fragilidad del sistema eh, socioeconómico en el que vivimos, no solo en, en, en el ámbito de la sanidad, en el ámbito de la industria, pero fundamentalmente en el tema de la alimentación y la importancia que tiene que los pueblos podamos garantizar nuestra alimentación de calidad y sana eh, por nuestros propios medios, sin depender de las grandes cadenas y de, la, de, de comercialización y del, y del transporte a nivel internacional. Eso sería, por otra parte, la, la importancia que tiene el, el, la, la vida en el, en el ámbito rural, el, la, la, con la alimentación sana y con la producción local, porque ha mostrado cómo, en general, en los ámbitos rurales, la incidencia de la pandemia ha sido mínima. O sea que no ha habido el, el tipo de, de vida en el ámbito rural y de producción, es también una defensa y una vacuna contra este tipo de situaciones. Para nosotros esto es evidente, sin embargo, desde el sistema no se lo interpreta así. Eh, y yo digo es evidente y con la implicación que tiene para la tierra, porque una, una distribución de la tierra en, entre los campesinos y tal es fundamental para que haya soberanía alimentaria. Pero digo que los estados no lo han visto así porque, por ejemplo, a pesar de la importancia que tenía la producción agrícola, han prohibido, han puesto traba a los mercados locales y a la venta directa de, de los productores. Y al mismo tiempo le han permitido a la, a la gran producción industrial que eh, han relajado todas las medidas de protección de los trabajadores, incluso de desplazamiento, para asegurar mano de obra a la gran producción y distribución industrial. ¿no? Entonces, hay cosas que son evidentes, son una oportunidad para, para que hagamos tomar conciencia, para que tomemos conciencia como sociedad, pero tengamos en cuenta que es una gran batalla, porque del otro lado hay muchos intereses, sobre todo de las grandes transnacionales, que ya se están preparando para decir que estas pandemias o este tipo de, de situaciones se combate con, asegurando seguridad alimentaria, que para ellos es gran producción industrial, transporte a miles de kilómetros y llevar alimentos a África, a Asia, donde, donde destruyen las economías locales. Thanks a lot. Um, I think we will have to, to stop here. I just want to tell you that we have uh, eight more questions that are not answered and uh, we will not be able to address them right away. But I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll find a way to, uh, to provide you with, uh, with answer on the, on the different questions that were asked in the question and, and answers section and thanks a lot all for your great questions and your participation. Over to you, Veronique. Thank you very much, Ruslan. Thank you again to all the speakers. And indeed, thanks a lot for the um, for the questions to, to the participants. Um, we're now reaching the end of this webinar. Um, uh, I, I really want to, um, well, again, thanks all of the speakers, thanks the, the, the great um, uh, organization team, and, and in particular, the interpreters. Um, as I said in introduction, um, without you, we wouldn't have been able to have that webinar. It's as simple as that, and we really appreciate appreciate um, your contribution and, and your enabling us to talk to each other. So huge thanks um, from all of us um, for your for your role. Um, I, I would also like to mention that um, um, as, as you have seen, there are many different stories in the handbook. I just want to give you a, a quick uh, maybe highlight to, to conclude um, of three more successful stories that are presented in the handbook um, and that are displayed the image that you can see now on your screen. Um, the, the, the image on top is a delegation of um, Via Campesina and other uh, allied organizations um, during in Geneva uh, at the time of the adoption of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants, which is the first international instrument to have recognized officially the right to land. Um, it's a very recent uh, instrument. It's a huge step ahead in terms of inter international instrument and recognition 
commission of land and right to land. Um, it is presented in the handbook thanks to the, the contribution of Fian. Um, so do have a, a look um, there if you're interested in understanding better how you can use international instruments in your in your struggle. And the two pictures um, at the bottom, the one on the left is a, a photo of a blockage of a, a bridge during the Notre Dame des Landes um, struggle in France against a, a project of airport, which again was successful few years ago after decades of mobilization, which as Raluca explained as well in the case of Rosia Montana, combined legal, uh, litigation um, with huge mass protests, with um, uh, policy work, so a very complex and, and very successful emblematic struggle as well. Um, and the last of those images which I'd like to share is a, a photo of a, a, a recent uh, group of students from the School of Shepherds in Catalonia, um, which trains mostly people coming from a non-farming background to help them become breeders and shepherds in Catalonia and they have uh, peasant farmers as mentors and it, it does um, bear witness to the fact that um, peasant farming is a, 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 a profession and a way of life of the future and not of the past. And many young people and not so young people are willing and able to embrace that profession if only they have a favorable environment. Um, so, so yeah, I just wanted to finish with those images of hope and success of the recent years. Um, just a last, well, two last points actually. Um, to first let you know that, um, as I said quickly in introduction, this webinar is the first of a series of five or six webinars, webinars which we will be having before and after summer around land strategies, land struggles, land policies in Europe. There will be two um, more seminars, webinars just before summer. One the week beginning, um, I think the, is it second or, or third of July? And the other one, the week starting, um, um, so the week of the 3rd of July on local land mobilization. So going deeper into a presentation analysis of the different ways of local mobilizations. And the, the other one will be um, the week starting 13th of July, and it will be specifically looking at ways to facilitate and support access to land for young people, for the youth. Um, and then after summer, we will have two more webinars, which will be exploring more the policy dimension, uh, both the national land policies and the EU and European framework for uh, preserving farmland and advancing access to land for peasant farmers and agroecology. Um, so just before I close, um, I would like to mention if one of my colleagues can send into the, the the chat if not done already um, as this is as I said the first webinar that we're having we are very much welcoming your feedback um, on the on this webinar so if you could just take a couple of minutes to answer an online poll we just have three four questions um, if you could take the time to answer that poll that would be a gr great help for all of us uh, thanks Jocelyn for for sharing the link so it's it's very quick and very helpful for us so if you've appreciated um, the the webinar do take a couple of minutes to answer um, and feel free as I said um, also to start the webinar will be recorded it will be made available so Again, if you found it interested, uh, feel free to share. We will be sharing the link again through newsletter and social media and website. Feel free to share the link and the recording of the of this webinar with more participants, more people if you if you enjoyed it. Um, and do stay tuned to the the next webinars which we'll be organizing. Again, a huge thanks to huge thanks to all of the speakers and interpreters and um, con good continuation to all for your your work uh, around food sovereignty and and land mobilizations in Europe. Uh, goodbye. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Goodbye. Have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. You can still take time to answer the survey. <laughs>